welcome back everybody to Psychedelics Today. This is your host, Kyle Buller. In this episode, I get to chat with Dr. Ido Cohen, uh, one of the co-founders over at the the, the Integration Circle, <laughs> um, an integration network and circle that's based out of uh, San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Cohen completed his PsyD at the California Institute of Integral Studies, CIS, over in San Francisco. And during his time there, he spent his time researching the integration process of ayahuasca. So his uh, doctoral dissertation was on the integration process of ayahuasca ceremonies in Western individuals and also incorporated a Jungian framework or or lens to to view this work. Uh, So in this episode, we chat about his dissertation, um, some of his findings, what he, uh, some common themes with integration and uh, interviewing people that went through ayahuasca ceremonies and then we get to chat about the integration process how he approaches that and we also explore kind of different frameworks um of maybe understanding what integration is uh we kind of came to the agreement that you know should be kind of a holistic approach incorporating the pre the like pre-session, during the session, after the session, that's all encompassing the integration process. It's not just looking looking at the experience after the psychedelic experience or, or ceremony, that everything plays a role into the integration process and integration, yeah, includes all those pieces. So this was a really interesting conversation. Um, I really wish we could have chatted for hours or longer uh, because we were getting into some really interesting things towards the end, but just didn't have enough time. Um, so I'm going to keep this intro a little short because we did go over a little bit on in, in the interview, which was totally okay on my end. I kind of lost track of time uh, chatting with Dr. Cohen. And so hopefully you'll hear from him, more from him in the future. I'm sure we'll have him back on um, to talk more about young psychedelics and integration. So really hope you guys enjoy this episode and all right, just a little bit of uh, updates or business. If you want to support the show, you really like uh, what we're doing here over at Psychedelics Today, you can support the show a few ways. Um, One could be through Patreon, so a monthly donation that helps us, you know, pay our bills and keep the lights on over here. Um, So any sort of monthly donation really goes a long way for us and we really appreciate that. We also have some trip journals and integration workbooks uh, on Amazon. Uh, The PDFs are available on our shop, um, but if you want a physical copy, you can go over to Amazon.com and type in Psychedelics Today, and you'll find those physical uh, copies of the trip journal and the integration workbook there. Really awesome resources, so if you're preparing a journey or you're... uh, you know, do, in the middle of your integration process, really great resources to check out. Highly recommend it. Um, and also, you could support the show or and Psychedelic Say the project um, by checking out some of our free courses. Um, we have we recently just updated the video and audio on our eight common mistakes. Uh, so if you go over to psychedelicstoday.teachable.com and click to enroll in eight common mistakes you'll get um, all the nice updated video if you're already enrolled in that i highly recommend going back and checking it out Um, we were able to do some recording in person which was really great so updated video and audio in that class we also have a free class on spiritual emergence or psychosis and then we also have of course our flagship course navigating psychedelics lessons on self-care and integration which we are currently running some live supported cohorts of this course one for general track people that just want to get educated in psychedelics and go through the course together and then we also are running a therapist and clinician course at the moment <clears throat> which is going really well i think we're about two weeks in as i'm recording this um so you know if you missed signups keep your uh eyes and ears open we will be launching a new cohort for these live supported courses um, very soon and we will probably be running these throughout the summer and throughout the year so uh, definitely stay tuned and if you 
can't support us uh, monetarily, that's totally fine. Um, if you want to support the show, leaving us a review on iTunes or Facebook really helps out. Um, subscribing to the show on any of your favorite podcast applications, Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts or by sharing some content. So if there's a show that you really liked, um, you know, you could share it with your friends, network, um, community on social media, um, retweeting anything of ours, or if you follow us on Instagram, uh, maybe reposting one of our photos or posts. Um, helping just share the content is actually one of the best ways to help support us as well because it helps uh, spread the message, spread our work, and continue to grow. So, I hope you all enjoy this episode with Dr. Ido Cohen. Uh, yeah, we'll catch you on the other side. All right, welcome back to Psychedelics Day, everybody. I'm joined here with Dr. Ido Cohen. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Kyle. I'd say uh, thank you, Joe, but he's not here too. But thank you both for this opportunity. Mm, I believe really you. Appreciate- I believe Joe is getting back from Utah. Uh, they ah, went away right, for the so weekend. Um, yeah. May you have a gentle landing, but thank you guys for both for the opportunity and for the work you do. Really appreciate what you guys are doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we first kind of stumbled across each other, I guess almost probably like three years ago or so. I was <laughs> um, helping manage the maps list and we had a bunch of phone calls and then I met you connecting through that. I think you were just finishing up your uh, PsyD program and you were talking about that you had a dissertation on ayahuasca and integration. Piqued my interest, been wanting to get you on the show for a while, um, but that's usually how scheduling goes. We <laughs> get the interest and then a lot of back and forth and things get better built up so i'm glad you're here now i'm glad to be here only took us three years but (laughs) (laughs) um do you want to give a brief little background for people um about who you are and how'd you how'd you get into the psychedelic space and just what you do sure um so i'm a clinical psychologist based in san francisco um worked with both individuals and couples and do integration groups um I graduated from California Institute of Integral Studies, uh, did their clinical psychology program, um, had the fortune to, as part of that process, uh, do my postdoctoral internship at the C.J. Jung Institute in San Francisco, um, which is one of the cornerstones of my education and kind of my experience. Um, How I got into psychedelics is a really entheogen psychedelics the psychedelic world it's a uh, it's a really good question um i got to it i had a uh, fascination since i was a teenager um had very little experiences as a teenager kind of uh, growing up but then i went to i uh, went to india and that opened up a lot of the psycho spiritual realm for me psychedelics played some part in it but actually a very small part um but it really validated for me this idea that there is a lot more to reality than what we see and something that i always kind of knew and felt intuitively um being in india was was another validation and then having those like, experiences there was like, oh, yes, this is, there's a lot more to myself. There's a lot more to reality. Um, and fast forward, when I came here, uh, I got finally did, after years of being curious, had the privilege to experience ayahuasca with a very renowned shaman, um, had a very intense experience um, that spoke to every level of my beingness really. And when it was time to choose my dissertation topic, I was like, okay, I wanted to, I knew I wanted to study change. That's one of the questions I had since coming back from India and being exposed now to this new, uh, to shamanism and plant medicine and plant shamanism is how, okay, now that I've had this incredible experience, how do I take it and make it part of who I am and my day-to-day life. And my dissertation chair said, great, that's a really great question, but you have to choose one experience. You can't just talk about 
change in general. And I was like, okay, what is the experience that shook every part of my, my, my being, That's my body, my emotions, my psychology, my spirituality. And I was like, I was good. And it was like a, it's kind of a very natural match. It felt like the right thing to go to look to you, the right practice, the right cosmology to look into in order to understand what happens that catalyzes change and then what happens, what would we need to do? How do we need to be in order to facilitate change into long-term sustainable change? Right. Yeah. So that's in short. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that is a huge question. And mm-hmm. I think it, it's so curious. Like, what is causing the change when we are taking psychedelics? Um, is it something biochemical, right? Is how is how the substance that's interacting with our brain and serotonin receptors and all this? Or is it um, something within the transpersonal experience there? Agreed. I- which part has more say in this process of change? Are they really separate? Um, maybe it's all of them together. I think um, it's yeah. probably a mix of both, but yeah, <laughs> I know there's the, I the two separate camps, right? <laughs> exactly. I think we need I a, a holistic approach to that. Definitely agree. Um, integrative approach seemed to me like the best way to think about these things though. And so with um, your dissertation, I know that you kind of uh, had this Jungian influence as well. Um, so I guess let's go through that a little bit. Like, what were you, how, how are you tracking change with ayahuasca? And I know your focus was on integration. Sure. Um, so when, I, when we thought about this, you know, I thought about how, how, is, how exactly am I going to look into this? Uh, what became very clear is to talk to people who had... Um, big transformative ayahuasca experiences and kind of to look at it as actually integration being the whole scope of it. So what was happening before in this person's life? What were they bringing into their uh, ceremony experience? What were their intentions? Um, What actually happened in the experience? But focusing more on, okay, what happened in the short term after you came back and then in the long term. So I interviewed people who were at least a year after what they thought was a big transformative experience. So they were talking in retrospect. So they had some time to reflect. They had some time to be with this process, to to relate to it, to use it, um, to try to understand what, what the hell was happening. Uh, so they could tell me in retrospect, like, okay, this is what I saw happening. This is how this experience was. These were the challenges and the beautiful things that happened to me afterwards. This is what I did with it. And this is how um, I was able to take that experience and create change. I like what you um, <clears throat> said about integration being like the whole scope of the experience. So pre, during, and then after. I feel like Sometimes we think of integration as what happens afterwards, um, but it really is. It's everything that's leading up to it. It is the experience, and then it's yeah. How, how is how are we continuing to work with that afterwards? So um, we always used to say, like in our breathwork um, workshops and whatnot, you know, the process really begins when you first land on the website and think, mm-hmm. I'm going to do this. Um, you know, there's already emotions starting to stir up. There's already feelings, memories that start popping up, and that process has already begun. Um, so I, I, I agree. Like that. Agreed. And I love that you have you guys have that perspective. I I think it's easy for us to kind of separate those. Like, no, that's one thing. That's another thing. And as opposed to seeing that as in a more, like you said, holistic way, which is like, no, they're all somehow connected, right? We just have to like slow down enough to see that connection. Um, right. What made me go into psychedelics today and press that link and be curious about that workshop, right? Why did I get into it? Um, can I give it some space? Oh yeah. And that's something that was very clear also in, in my work with clients and in my dissertation is uh, a lot of people have some, something, something is calling them. Um, 
either right, a dream or I think for most people, right, it's either curiosity or suffering. Um, they're either curious about something, you're right, like, oh, I heard about it and I want to try it or like, I'm having all these things are happening. I'm, I'm ready for change. Um, but yeah, not, not thinking about them as separate. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, a whole process. Um, and maybe coming from a Jungian background and maybe this is more in like archetypal language. Um, but what is part of this process, right? Psyche is part of this and yes. it's there with us at, at all times. And yeah, what is, exactly. un, what is unfolding there? Um, you know, Psyche is drawing you to this. It's already starting to Yes, yeah, the, the process is already working out. And for anybody who doesn't mm-hmm. like, understand that, I, I'm taking um, an archetypal psychology approach to the, the word psyche, James Hillman. Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> meaning, and he kind of reflects that of soul, but not saying soul is spirit. More soul is like this creative force within that drives yes. us. Um, yes, so. yes. And yeah, right. We can look at it as um, maybe I'm motivated to go and doing this because, right, the I don't know how much we want to get, but the biggest self, right? This some the this semi amorphous spiritual entity that is both inside of us and around us, right, is sending a message, and my psyche is picking up on that message. And it maybe it comes through a crisis, it maybe it comes through a feeling, it maybe it comes through a dream or quote unquote coincidence um, or synchronicity, if we want to be really union. <laughs> um, but that there is something I like what you're saying in the sense that. Uh, it's coming, this message is coming through a relationship we're having with something. Either our unconscious or the self or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And were you seeing, like when you were doing interviews, people that were participating in ayahuasca um, ceremonies, were they looking for change post? Or do you think it was some people were more just curious about the experience? Or were a lot of people going in with, I want to change? So, yeah, um, as far as intentions, I think I, most of the people I interviewed, um, they had some version uh, of a loose intention. Um, Some of them had things that were more clear, like, you know, my my brother passed away. I'm feeling really sad and I can't, I'm stuck. I got really depressed. I wanted to really understand that um, versus other people who are more like, I feel like something is off. I feel like something is out of alignment. I can't put my finger on it. I want to go and get clarity because I know it impacts me. Um, so yeah, I think it really, it really depended on who these people were as far as like who they're in, like what their environment was. A lot of people who have friends who are into this, they were really encouraged like, oh, you know, set an intention and really think about it. And, you know, um, when you have that kind of conscious support, um, it's easier to like have that in mind versus people who didn't have that. So they had, you know, they were, they loosely read somewhere that one should think about why they're, why you're going to do this or something like that. And they came up with something either with their therapist or just alone. Mm-hmm. So I would say that would be the rough two camps people that I even knew. Right. And so it sounds like it, you know, to some extent, somebody was looking to, to make a change when they were wanting to participate. Yes. Yeah. I think all of them without, I'm pretty sure all of them had that desire, either intention or no intention. They wanted to, they had something they wanted to create change in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so following these people throughout, were there any common themes like um, when you were trying to understand change throughout, throughout that year that you were with them? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there were, there were a few common themes. Um, you know, as far as the actual, there were common things in the, the experience itself. Um, I think, so I don't know how much we want to get into the actual experience versus the, if we're separating integration into it, but yeah, you know, I think the common experience as far as in the ceremony actually was that people felt that they had to go through something very personal before they can get into a much more uh, archetypal spiritual 
visions or downloads or tapping into other other realms, um, which I found really interesting as far as is there a way in which we have to cross through our personal kind of unconscious, the things we haven't worked out that are really close to the surface before we can open to something bigger. Um, so that was one theme. Um, I think for me, what it got, because I wanted to get to focus on integration is um, the themes that came after, mm. which was like the difficulties in re-entry. Like I came with this huge experience, now what? Or even more than that, what it was like, oh my God, coming back into this environment is really, really hard. And I'm starting to feel all the old pressures and the old patterns kicking up. Now, what do I, how do I stay in that without losing touch with my experience and my desire to change? Um, and then I think the other one was, uh, another big one was, um, oh, that people... In that time of coming back, um, one huge thing that I think I came out of this conversation was people saw that they need to change their attitude towards their process of healing, um, which I found was very, very fascinating that almost all the people I talk to, and I see it also with the people I work with in my practice, um, there, there comes a point when they're like, I'm understanding that there is something happening inside and I have to focus, I have to turn my focus inwards. I have to focus my, I have to make myself available to this process. Because if I'm not gonna make myself available, nothing is gonna change. And actually I'm just gonna have more suffering because something is happening. And I thought that that was really important piece because it feels like before you can change anything, you need to kind of have that change in attitude. Right. And did, you saw that like throughout most of the uh, participants that you interviewed or was it just, yeah. Yes, wow. participants that I interviewed, people that I've seen in my practice, uh, my community, um, once, but the people I interviewed really put that in words that I was like, exactly, it's a change in attitude. Mm. And there was something about releasing, really making a decision to um, be open no matter what was coming up, to really be open and follow what this process is doing. Um, you know, like, for example, I remember talking to a person who came back after a month in Peru, and um, she was after treating, uh, she was after cancer treatments that she felt was totally this connected her from her vitality and sexuality and um, it was very clear to her in Peru that when she's coming back, she needs to go live in nature. But then she came back to Bay Area Life and she's like, wait, I need to make money. <laughs> I need to pay bills. I need to like, how am I going to do this? And But she said that through really making, honoring that process and changing her focus towards, again, being with what's happening inside. She was like, I had to quit my job. I told my friends I'm going to be, you know, moving an hour and a half away. And if they want, they will have to come see me in the woods. And she said that what was interesting for her is, although it took some time, when she really followed that, things started falling into place. Mm. She found a new job closer to her house. Um, people were very willing to support her community. People came to see her in the woods. Um, somehow, quote unquote, things started working out. Um, yeah, so just as an example of what that means to change attitude. Yeah, this this is really interesting. I've been thinking a lot about this um, recently. Maybe I've been influenced a little bit by this process philosophy thing that I was just I, Joe and I were just out in Claremont at this at this conference and thinking about like what are our relationships to, to these processes um, and say, what is our relationship to, you know, you said, yeah, the change the attitude um, to the process of healing. Um, and, and what is that relationship there? And how can we become conscious of our relationship yes. in this process and figuring out, okay, how am I really, how am I in relationship with this process? And then how can I mm -hmm. 
change that a little bit. And it could be by just doing little experiments, like being like, oh, what happens if I, I mean, that, no, that's a big experiment, quitting your job. But, like, <laughs> um, you know, maybe how could you break that down into smaller little things? And maybe sure. see how some of that stuff might open up. Um, and then I think you're kind of getting into like flow a little bit, right? Because you're starting mm-hmm. to be maybe a little bit more aligned with um, yes. whatever you want to call it, you know, your life purpose or I don't know, this bigger organism that we're part of. I... No, no, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I love that you guys are, that's, I'm exactly in the same line. It's, I think a lot of it is, um, like you said, experiments. I would say it's play. Yeah. Like, okay, play. Go, like we said before we started, right? Go be in nature more. If that's what you feel called for after your experience, let's see. Let's see what happens that instead of watching TV on two hours on Saturday, you go take a hike every Saturday. Yeah. And let's see what happens. If it, maybe all of a sudden, like you said, you know, the alignment feels better. I feel better. Um, so, yeah, I'm really happy you brought that up. The idea of, but even, to do that, there is a change in attitude that has to happen. You have to make the decision to experiment, to right. play. Yeah. Right? To give something up in order to make room for something new. And I think even becoming somewhat self aware of how are you in relationship and how's your attitude towards that? I mean, that can even be scary, right? Just kind of facing, like, wow, I'm really avoidant of this stuff. And yes. all right, if I am yeah. avoidant of this, then. How do I force myself or maybe challenge myself? Yeah, maybe not force, but how do I challenge myself to maybe try something different where I'm not avoiding it? Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I, I definitely agree. You know, you brought up, I think, maybe one of the key words for me as far as this process, which is the fact that it is a relationship. That although it's not a person or something right material we can catch, this experience is an entity that we are constantly relating to. Yeah. So if you really think about it, right, it also just by observing how we integrate, we can learn how we relate to these big experiences that we have. Like, do I give it time? Do I honor it? Do I invest in it? Do I love it? Or like, am I avoiding? I actually want to dissociate from it because it's really hard and it's challenging and it's painful. Right. And it's not a judgment, but just even being aware of that. Right. Like, let me just look how I'm relating to this and get curious about that. Um, can make, makes a huge difference, a huge, huge difference in this process. So yes, it's it's all a relationship process in a way integration. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. I've try, been trying to really work on that and view that in the past few years as I've been chewing on this topic for a while. Um, and I think some of that stuff that I was listening to from the, the process uh, point of view kind of help put that in a little bit more perspective for me um and it's just like a really interesting way to approach it right like Mm -hmm. you break it down to the microcosm and it's like some cells are in relationship to create some sort of process or system what if a cell stopped being a cell and they're like "Eh, i don't want to function this way anymore (laughs) you know and and they and they stop doing that and it's like well convert that to your life and what are the processes around you that you're interacting with and having a relationship with and how are you showing up um in those in those processes and what yeah yes yes i mean right so so one of the things that I used uh, and I think just works really well with integration is Jung's idea that of ego self access, right? So the idea is that from his perspective, the ego, there is this relationship between the part of us that takes things, makes sense of them, organizes them, and then puts them into reality, external reality, and the self, which is the unconscious and the imaginal and Right, where psychedelics experience happens, antigenics, dreams, all this stuff happens. And he's basically saying, look at what your relationship between these two right, parts, these two selves. Is, is your ego fighting anything every time yourself is putting something in your ego's like, vicinity? Is it fighting, trying to fight for control? Like, no, I have to stay this way or that's or judges it or criticizes it or dissociates from it. Or do they have more harmony? Hmm. Right, which is like, oh, I just found out this really beautiful or painful piece of new information. Can I just, again, have a healthy relationship with it? Can I hang out with it? Can I sit with it? Can I feel it, sense it in my body? Maybe let my imagination kind of go. Can I reflect on it? 
or am I invested in pushing away for some good reason? Mm. So yeah, as far as like organisms working together, systems working together inside of us. Yeah, really interesting. Um, something else I've been really thinking about too is kind of integrating some attachment schemes to that as well, like um, just how how maybe some of your childhood stuff and the attachment, like was there secure attachment and maybe there is some stuff that you're really avoidant from or is there a lot of security in your life and making changes a little bit easier? Um, mm -hmm. and how, does, how does that influence your healing process as well? Yes, agreed. And it's, you know, back to you asked about common themes um, as far as attachment and creating security. One of the things that I see and I think is, makes sense but we don't utilize enough is the role of community in yeah. integration right it's to have both community and working with someone i think you know maybe it's me i'm israeli so maybe becoming from a collectivist culture where our survival depends on us being together for better and for worse <laughs> right and coming to america or like you know more western cultures where it's more like no we're doing separate um, and that actually having a community or doing this kind of intense work with someone can help with creating more safety. So your attachment with your experience can actually move from maybe I want to be avoidant or ambivalent or it totally frightens me and I can't even think about it to no, I'm having some support. I have some holding and that creates more safety for me to be with my experience and I can use these people. It can get, even if it means they just hug me when I need it or someone that helps me really dive in deeper and really deeply reflect and look into the symbols and work with my body or, um, right, if it's somatic experiencing or Hakomi or dance or holotropic breathwork or working with an informed therapist slash integrator, right, someone that can help me, like, work with me on my trauma if that was came up or even to the opposite work with me of like okay i had this ecstatic blissful experience how can i have more of that right not just we need to learn to integrate not just the negatives it's also the positives right yeah and this is something <laughs> i've been thinking about too um sometimes those positives are really really difficult um, I actually was just watching, uh, I don't know, Netflix, uh, America or world's worst prisons, but I was watching the one on, um, Norway and how they're really interested in like restorative justice. And somebody was saying that coming into this place where the, uh, you know, the officers are shaking inmates hands and being friends with them. It's really uncomfortable for some people that have just been treated like crap their entire life. Right. And so mm. having, um, yeah, even those those pleasurable experiences and feeling good can feel unsafe to some people, right? Like, oh wait, this is much different oh. than than what I'm used to. Exactly, and I think for you know, when our system is not used to an experience, positive or negative, referring right in duality, it's unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. So it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if it's positive or negative in the beginning, at least. It's just unfamiliar, and by unfamiliar, it's risky. Yeah. Right? I mean, I remember working um, with a person who <clears throat> had a very intense LSD experience. Um, this is a person who described never experiencing fear in their life before. They came from a really war-torn war country. So they were used to trauma all the time. So... For this person to feel excitement, they had to jump out of planes and do like very extreme kind of sports to get their like, right, their body moving. And, and then they had this experience in downtown San Francisco and this person felt fear for the first time. Wow. And I had to, you know, we had to sit together and feel fear and put words to it and, you know, like a new experience. And what was interesting is that Side by side with that, this person already also started feeling love. Mm. And this person said, you know, I'm noticing my partner just told me that since this happened, I have been the most loving I've been. And I don't know what to do with that. So we had to work on feeling fear and feeling love at the same time. 
And sometimes those and are, really, are, are similar, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. I mean, right. So if we're going to bring it back to you, right, those would be two opposites. Yeah. So something freed up by feeling fear, something free, freed up by feeling love. But we had to like work on integrating love. Okay. Wow. So now you're having feelings towards these people and it makes you scared again because you know that you can lose them now. So how do we work with both of this? Um, which is maybe something, you know, I would, that feels important as far as integration, which is I think a lot of the time in the beginning from my experiences, you know, we go to the people go to these experiences, we go and we get a new experience, right? A new information about ourselves, the universe, the, right? The cosmos. And it's a meeting of old and new. Right? There is an old version of myself that went into this experience and I'm getting new information. And how can the old and the new relate? So there is a tension. I think there can be tension in the beginning or in the experience. Right? You talked about it as like tension of opposites. Like I knew myself as this and all of a sudden I get new information. What now? How do I stay open? How do I stay... Um, how do I stay in body? How can I stay in my body with maybe sensations that are cursing through my body with these new feelings, with the new insights, maybe a new spiritual right experience? How do I stay open to it when it's in opposition to things that, that I know, mm -hmm. or it's threatening the familiar, like we said, it's threatening the familiar. Right. And I think that's a lot where a lot of, where we need to kind of really be, mindful and, and slow down in integration, which is noticing that we're not closing down on that space too fast because it's scary. It's a scary space. Right. Yeah. And, you know, a question, that I, a question that I had for you is like, what are some of the difficulties of integration mm -hmm. with psychedelics or plant medicines? And I'm wondering if this is like, you know, one of the main components is like you have these big transform transformative experiences and then there's two parts of yourself there it's like whoa okay now what here's the old part that is trying that you, you're trying maybe trying to let go of and you went into an intention to try to let go of these old parts of self but then there's this new part that's showing up and that's terrifying for most people yeah. like oh wait i have to, i'm getting these messages to do things differently or maybe make a change and yeah. So do, would you see that as like one of the difficulties of doing like plant medicines or psychedelics? Yeah. Or yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, I think there's two, there's two dimensions of that for me. One is uh, personal and one is actually more um, environmental. So I think the environmental pieces that makes it hard is that we, most people have these experiences. We come back to the same urban environment, same work, work mindset, same, same cultural ideals that are about doing, achieving, um, fast processes, right? Instant coffee, that what I call instant coffee, like mentality. Everything, but it's true, right? You want everything fast. We want things fast because we don't want to suffer. We don't want to wait. We don't want to invest. We don't want to change or whatever our philosophy is about. It. And it's also what we're being told is possible. Here, take this and, you know, you won't feel anything. Here, do that and you'll be, you know, you look like this in 30 days or become this person if you read this book. Um, so I think it's like there's always this question of like, okay, if I come, I came back with this new experience, but to this old environment, how do I not let the pressure of the old environment and disconnect me from my experience? Right? How do I not, um, who can I talk to that maybe gets this experience more? What maybe, like maybe I shouldn't look at social media for the next week when I come back. Maybe I shouldn't look at the news because it distracts me or it, right, it creates new experiences or it's disturbing to me or whatever it is. Um, and then, you know, we have to, I mean, I think one of the things that there is still a big conversation in the psychedelic world, in my mind at least, is what happens when we work with people who go back to very, very intense, right, environments. 
I'm thinking about, um, right, there is a center in, in Peru, Takiwasi, I don't know if you know about it, right, that works with people who have addiction. They have great results. But these people who come back to the same environments that facilitated their addiction, and they don't usually, they don't necessarily have the option to go somewhere else or to try something different. So what do we do with that? Um, so I think there is that environmental piece. Um, and then the personal is really about how can I, like you said, change my attitude, right? So my attitude has been that I go to work from nine to five and then I go and I hang out with people or I watch something on Netflix or I do whatever. So how do I actually do something different? How do I take some time? Maybe I go journaling. Maybe I go, I go into nature because that's what felt right. Maybe I need to actually, my experience told me I need to connect with my body. When am I going to go dancing? I should look for a bit of that. Or, you know, more intense things. Like my experience showed me that I had this, you know, God forbid, sexual trauma. Or what do I do now? Like, how do I stay... Um, I think it's really hard to honor and see that as a sacred experience when I'm supposed to perform tomorrow at work <laughs> yeah. or, or even more complicated in my mind, if not as complicated, if not more, I'm supposed to be a good partner for my partner or a specific, or right. I'm supposed to be this type of person from my family or from my friends, but actually this experience is telling me I need to change. Mm. So how do I honor myself and my process and not succumb to those pressures of becoming, becoming someone that I used to be or engaging in the same coping mechanisms that I had before? Right. Which is, right, if every time I had intense feelings, my mechanism would be like, okay, I'm going to drown myself in my computer or, you know, go distract myself in the gym or whatever. Not that I'm judging people who are doing that, but when it's used as a way to dissociate. Mm -hmm. So how can I not do that? Right. What do I need to add into my life? Maybe some supports, maybe new habits um, so I can really stay connected. It's complex. It can be really complex. It is. It's very complex. And I've been thinking about environment recently. And do you, do you work with people that like have had really difficult environments that they go back to? And like, how would you support them to make change? Cause I think that is probably one of the hardest parts. Cause sometimes you're, you, you know, you don't always probably, you can't always change your environment. Maybe you can change your relationship to it somehow, but, um, like, yeah, I don't know. It's a very difficult thing. And, and I struggle with that early on. Um, when I had my near death experience of just not having community and, just being very young and being like, Ooh, how, how do I now what? You know? oh, um, wow. And so, yeah. And, yeah, environment is huge for a lot of people and especially people that don't live in these places where there's community and, you know, maybe not as progressive thinking and they're surrounded by people that might not quote unquote get the psychedelic experience or just that mind expansive transpersonal states and, you know, sometimes people can feel really alone and even isolate even more and kind of, you know, potentially kind of fall into it, uh, like more depressed or, or whatnot. So yeah. exactly. Yes. And, and I've heard those stories too. I've heard people who came back with incredible, incredible, potentially life altering experiences. And they came back to their old environments and feeling the isolation, feeling the disconnect from, you know, people start using this word, like the term of my tribe a lot after these experiences, right? Looking for the people who have similar experiences, who even if not have, but can think in those terms, can accept my new reality. Um, and not having that made people actually plunge into either just really depression or feeling really lonely and sad. And um, that became their process. Um, that's a really good question, Kyle. Uh, <laughs> I've worked with people who um, their experience was in opposition to their environment. And they were like, I don't know what to do. Like you said, I can't quit my job. I can't move. That's not realistic for me. Um, so what, you know, the way we uh, talked about it is, okay, what, it, what feels like a healthy compromise? Let's work within the realm of what's possible. 
you can't quit your job, I get it. You can't move, I get it. Okay, what can we do? So people started looking for integration circles, even if it's online. So at least there's someone to talk to. Um, people started, you know, for me, they either stayed in therapy or started looking for their own therapy, right? So at least there is someone. Um, look, going to events, like consciousness events, right? Even if it's not about psychedelics, go to meditation groups and at least to start to find people who they don't have to feel ashamed or embarrassed that they have these experiences and that they started thinking in terms of, you know, words that you and I just threw around, archetypes and the self. And, and that's for some people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it sounds like really weird and new age. And like, um, so at least having, I think the shame is the big one from what I've seen in the, both the people I interviewed and, you know, the groups that have integration groups and with my clients, um, feeling ashamed about one's one experience that will that's i think a pretty good indicator that it will kill or bury your experience mm. if you start feeling a lot of shame or embarrassment about it um, it creates isolation yeah and then you want to detach yourself from the things that makes you feel shame and isolation so you just let it go so it's re just yeah it really depends on the person but we've thought about okay what are resources vis-a-vis -vis communities or practices that can help you feel still connected, less ashamed, and less alone. Yeah. So important. Yeah. So important. Um, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier about like um, the importance of working with people. Do you think that's always, um, always important to have like an integration coach or therapist to work with or, or a community? I mean, I guess maybe we just answered it with talking about environment, but... Um, I think it depends on the person, yeah. really do. I think it depends on... Integration can look so many ways. Um, and I think we need to honor also what the person who's, you know, right? But do they want to go deeper? Or actually, they're like, you know, this is... I realize that I need to um, change my diet and disconnect this friendship with this person. And that's, that's what I want. It's like, okay, great. How can we facilitate? How can we support, support you, keep you accountable and help you facilitate this change? Um, I, I do think that there needs to be a other, it can be one person or a group. I think there are ways in which, um, we, we can only see ourselves to a certain extent. I can't be in my side, my experience and be totally outside of my experience at the same time. Um, I mean, you can, but on, again, also that would be limited. So having said, you know, there's something to be said about um, the vulnerability of being with someone, a group or one person and opening yourself up to this experience with this experience and having people point out maybe angles that you didn't see. Um, I actually had a person who said, uh, this is a person who spent years on years in Peru and said in numerous amount of, of ayahuasca ceremonies. And he, he said, um, I thought ayahuasca was intense until I started doing therapy. <laughs> therapy can and be he really was, intense. <laughs> you can. And he, I think what he was referring to is that the idea of being vulnerable and open about one's most intimate experience with someone. Yeah. Again, a group, a person doesn't really matter, but with someone that's on its own does so much, right? We feel belong. It's, the, it's when we feel belonging, we feel understood. When I say something that sounds like really shameful or weird in myself and someone is just like, yeah, I totally get it. I get it. How can I support you? Let me tell you about my weird, shameful, like beautiful, painful experience, whatever that is. Um, we feel met. You know, you brought up attachment. I think that uh, having those experiences is cure for attachment wounds, right? Here I am showing up with my feelings, with my needs, with my weirdest self, quote unquote, and I'm actually being received and I'm being loved and I'm being understood and appreciated. Wow. And that could be for the first time for somebody, right? And it's like, wow, that's, that's huge. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly.
You know, if, I think in our, you know, in the integration circles, we do as part of the integration circle. Um, I think that's been one of the most, the feedback that we got from the people who come to our circles is that just sitting with other people who are accepting me and listening to me uh, in such a mindful way is so profound. And then that's been a repetitive like feedback we got from people. Just being in the circle with these people, talking about it like this, sharing like this, crying together, laughing together, you know, getting ecstatic together is is 50% of the healing for them. Yeah, I think group process is so big for a lot of people. And I think a lot of people are really afraid of groups. And, you know, maybe that is kind of evolutionary in a sense, hardwired in our nervous system of, ooh, do I feel safe here? Am I going to get kicked out? Am I accepted? Right. Um, but I remember I was leading a, an anxiety group at my internship. And there was somebody from another country there. And they didn't think they would have anything in common because just totally different cultural background and they had a hard time speaking fluent English and after hearing what other people were going through they thought I thought I was all alone in this coming from a different place but I didn't realize that even other people are going through this and I didn't think I was going to be able to fit in um, and, and that was like a huge thing because this person felt really alone thinking oh I'm from this other country and you know, nobody gets it. And then yeah. realizing, oh, wait, there's other people that have other experiences that also feels good that like I, I can resonate with that. And mm -hmm. I don't feel as alone. I think that's huge for a lot of people. Huge. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you approach the integration process? Like, what's your framework or how do you approach this? Because it is such an individual thing. I mean, Joe and I have been working on this integration course for the past, like, two plus years. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, just getting so many different perspectives. Um, so I'm curious on how, how you approach this work. Um, it's a great question. I think, it you know, it depends. Um, if this is a person that I'm going to see that's coming just for that. So usually it's for a shorter amount of time. I will see them between two and four or five times um, versus if it's someone that I work with long-term, I will look differently. Um, I think there's a way in which I want to know, I want to hear the story, but I really want to focus on the parts that feel like they have a lot of energy in them. So it's a lot of emotional energy or right, a lot of excitement, or actually the parts of the story you don't want to hear, you don't want to talk about. So I'm actually keep my ears open to those two. Because, um, you know, I've, I'm lucky I had great teachers, like people like uh, Francois Buzerat, who's been doing this year for this work for years, um, and Susana Bustos, another uh, professor from CIS. Um, and I think it's easy for us to get lost in our story. You know, we can talk, 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 and it's uh, so easy to get mesmerized by the, you know, the bright, shiny lights and good feelings, which are important, very important. But it's then easy to kind of get sucked into that and then, like, oh, that, 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 that part where I saw this vision about the thing that really hurts me, that doesn't matter. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, listening to that and... Um, then thinking about with the people like, okay, let's see if there's something we're identifying that this person wants to go deeper into or feels like it's uh, keeping them stuck or actually causing pain, we go and go deeper into that. So um, because I do come from a very Jungian background, uh, I do listen to, okay, if there are symbols or archetypes that showed up for the person, um, and that can be either an image or a process, right? Like I felt I was like burned at the stake. Okay, so there's something about, right? We can start wondering potential like purification of something or like, right, or martyrdom or something like an archetypal process. So we wanna, I wanna listen to that and go a little deeper um, and see what's, it's always for me, like we said about what's that person's relationship to this insight. Like, are they like, oh my God, now it makes me understand, although it hurts or it's beautiful, it's, this is new information. Okay, now I'm going to start digesting this. So we, we think together about, okay, how? 
what, what are the practices, right? So this is where it splits for me because I'm thinking both, okay, practices, right? So are we journaling? Are we dancing? Are we going in nature? Um, maybe we're doing body work, maybe breath work, maybe actually we need to go do some trauma therapy or something, right? Whatever it is. Um, so how do, what do we need to facilitate that inner process? And, and this side by side, there is, uh, and I separate those, there is a process of implementation, mm. right? So mm. like we do all this inner processing and then it's like, okay, I have realized after six, three weeks, three months, six months, right? Of integration. I'm like, okay, I have realized that this is what I want to do. Um, for example, I, I was thinking about this um, when I was listening to your uh, podcast with Robin, you guys talked about, she brought up doing couples integration or preparation. And I think you guys said something on the lines of, well, what happens if someone comes back and they're like, well, maybe I shouldn't be married to this person anymore. <laughs> and I actually interviewed someone who had that experience. Mm. Uh, she came back and she was like, oh, wow, I... I don't need to be in this. And she was devastated. Right. So it took her a few months, but through, because she was, she had a community, she had someone that she worked with. So they slowly built, right. All the ways built acceptance with that. And okay. How do I, what do I need right now in the present to support me as I'm like digesting and grieving and processing this. And then it was like, okay, implementation time. I need to go and talk to this person. And then I need to go and possibly move because we live together. So, right. So kind of like with the way I work, it's like, okay, so we do this inner processing and then we also want to listen to, okay, so how, when it's implementation time, okay, what do we do now to support you to actually implement this into the outer world? Yeah. That's huge. I mean, right. <clears throat> uh, moving forward, right? How, how do we bring this process forward and, and create that change and exactly. sit there and process and kind of dwell on it. But if we're not taking action or yeah, moving this forward, then, then, then what are we doing? Exactly. And you know, this person said one of the most, I remember it by heart because it was so beautiful. She said that through her integration, like inner process, she said, I realized that <clears throat> such a beautiful sentence. She said, I realized that I had to break my own heart. Mm if I really want to change this, change myself and change the situation. And I was like, that felt like such a beautiful encapsulation of like a really full integration process. Like I have to break my own heart because I see the benefits and the truth in it. And I'm choosing to follow that. Wow. And she broke off a marriage and went on to live a very happy life. <laughs> <laughs> And that's got to be a very hard, life. that's got to be a very hard integration process. I mean, you know, I, I definitely have seen this come up a whole bunch. And I think that's probably why I asked that question with Robin, because I've seen it come up in breath work where they go, oh, my God, I'm in this terrible relationship. Uh, uh, or, it, you know, it's just it, we're not compatible anymore. And, you know, we always encourage people stick with that for like three, six months. And if it's a big change, then yeah, then how do we start moving forward with that? Right. But, um, yeah. It's... Yeah, you want to follow the Stan Graf rule, which is don't do anything for at least 72 hours after, right? 72 hours or something. Yeah, after. exactly. Yeah, don't do anything. But so how, do you, how do you and Joe uh, engage with people who have such an experience um, when they come out of the yeah, so, with them? So I guess the way I've been really kind of thinking about this is um, how do we... I guess getting somebody really grounded first. Um, so really kind of taking care of the self, getting grounded. Um, in my work, when I worked with people with early episode psychosis, I was really, I went in there with like a spiritual emergence framework and like I really mm -hmm. wanted to work on the inner process and, and kind of work with that. And I realized it doesn't really work as much until somebody can kind of get back in their body, um, until they're ready to start processing. And so... 
you know, how do you just support those emotions, get somebody grounded and then do the processing? Um, but yeah, when s- stuff like that comes up, we, we really encourage people to stay in contact with us. Um, and also just to, yeah, maybe not make a, a big decision right away. And um, how, how could you sit with that in your body for a little bit? Um, and, you know, if it feels right a month later, two months later, then OK, then how, how could we start working with that? Because um, and sometimes, you know, trust the universe. I, I shared this story one time. I was really, I was really frustrating in a breathwork work uh, session of my own, and it was about my job. And I was like, I, I really just want to quit, but I can't quit. And uh, it, was, it was just really pissed me off <laughs> during that session. And um, you know, I think like three weeks later, four weeks later, my boss gave us a, a, a one week letter saying, you know, I'm closing the shop in one week. And I just like, eh, well, I guess that worked itself out. And so <laughs> even just kind of staying open to the process and, you know, uh, so I, for me personally, like I really think about like all those times that I've wanted to make really big change and just reminding myself to sit with it. And if it's right, I'll still feel that way. And, you know, maybe if you start experimenting and, and working with it a little bit, yeah, sometimes mm-hmm. things just open up and the world has a very strange way of working out. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it does take some effort and action. It can't just rely on the universal energy. Yeah, I know. yeah, yeah. I, I like you. You're bringing both, which you, right? You do the, uh, we do the work as much as we can do and then we need to just trust the rest. Trust, yeah. Yeah, we can't control the results in that way. Yeah. Y- you said something about, um, you know, those big kind of shiny um, experiences. Do you work with people that, that you've identified maybe, um, spiritual bypassing at all? And maybe how do you work with any of that? Cause that, that seems like a big thing in this community. Yeah. Maybe we're not talking about, maybe people don't really know about it. And well, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing it up. Um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I live in San Francisco. I live in the Bay area. Uh, it's the hub for a lot of consciousness movements and there is a lot of spiritual bypass. Um, there's a great book by, um, Masterson called spiritual bypass that I highly recommend to, um, everybody who's interested in following the spiritual path Um, because he, he really does a really good job talking about it as a natural parts of a growth process. So from his, he brings this perspective of the idea is not, not to get too hard on yourself when you are doing it, but to actually use that as like a stop sign to say, okay, what's going on? Why am I hopping between one circle of medicine to another circle, to another circle, to another circle, to another circle? circle? Like what's happening? Um, why am I all of a sudden, you know, like only into what's like li- filled with lights and positive, right? Positive vibes. Like what's that about? And i not, you know, anything that has shadow or like pain or I'm like pushing away. So just to kind of use that, but, oh yeah, I've seen a lot. I think in, um, if I have to say the most common ones are, um, searching for some kind of ecstatic experience mm. and anything uh, that doesn't fit that description, I don't, I totally disregard. And I've seen people um, come back to um, ayahuasca circles or MDMA like experiences um, from a place of hunger, mm. not from a place of, of, consciously and I mean like you're saying in an embodied way wanting to go into an experience they're like you know using <clears throat> Gabor Mate's example they're like hungry ghosts and like mm-hmm. just chasing this thing out of a deep sense of suffering but the suffering wasn't conscious so it's just like no 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 I just want to transcend I want to experience this and I'm like yes that's great that is fantastic but this is your 12th ceremony in six months like what's happening yeah Again, no judgment, but can we just pause and say, like, let's look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, the other com- more common one that I've seen is a desire to, when there is processing, um, to disregard old, com- like, again, using Jungian language, old complexes, because I've already worked on it. Mm. 
Like, why is this? I've already looked into my relationship with my family. I already looked into this. Like, I don't want to look at it again. Can I just experience something different? Which I totally get, right? We want to get to a place where, like, I don't, I'm not dealing with the same thing over. Can I get some, some beauty? Can I get some, you know, I totally understand. Like, I had moments where I wanted to go into an, you know, expanded state and just experience the beauty or something mysterious, right? Or, like, fairies and the hummingbirds and all that. And instead I got something really opposite. <laughs> uh, so I get the desire. Um, but I think when it creates this uh, total motivation to disconnect from anything that's not that, that's when it becomes to be problematic. Right. Um, yeah, I would say that those are the big two that I've seen. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, it's just like an interesting thing. I mean, I probably know a definitely been guilty of it early on um exploring non-ordinary states and just wanting to do something but you brought up an interesting point about like kind of repeating the same thing i mean that, that was happening to me a lot in my breathwork stuff i'm like i, I thought i got rid of this stuff I, I i why is this keep coming back and then i i really thought about it and i was like well am i making any of these changes in my life like, am I actually working on this stuff? And I got to the point where I, where I, I took a break from like doing a lot of that deep work to actually do the work in my life and be like, okay, what happens like actually when I set up or um, I, I come and like kind of sit in the fire with all this stuff? Mm -hmm. um, and then how is that going to change my process? Um, yeah. Just, yeah. And I, I agree. And I, the only thing I would add is that there is something very – um, wounded masculine for me and thinking in linear terms like I work on something I resolve it as opposed to I think for me it's much more of a feminine process in the sense that if I meet something it doesn't mean that I meet it at the same place mm. that it's more spiral in the sense that yes here I am working on my relationship with x y or whoever but maybe I'm like taking away one there that's deeper Maybe this time we're meeting it in a layer that's a little deeper than the other, the last time I met it. So to be curious enough, I, one of the things that I found really helps people integration is to really encourage people that when you start feeling criticizing towards your experience, to use that as a way to like, actually, that's where I need to be more curious. Right. Yeah. That's so a good really point. shifting from criticism to curiosity. Yeah. Um, and that can make a huge difference. Why? So, oh, am I, here I am again working on this relationship with my mom. Wait, let me look at it. What did I see this time around? Oh, actually, yes, there's still pain there. There's still grief there. Right? Uh, I remember one of my, uh, the people that I interviewed had um, worked a lot on his relationship with his mom and <laughs> went into a ceremony and obviously that came and he got really, he said, he got really angry. It's like, fuck, excuse my language. Why, why again? Why this? Why again? And interestingly enough, just him asking that question, he had a whole different experience because he, he saw then that underneath that story, there is this very young, terrified part of himself, totally alone and isolated. And that actually being angry at the story made him miss that part of him. Right. And he had this beautiful vision where he saw this younger version of himself and they were hugging and they were crying together. And he made a promise. He was like, I will never abandon you again, which it was his issue with his mom, his mm -hmm. mom abandoned. So his integration was actually very, very sweet. He, every day for six months would, take a bunch of time and he would eat chocolate with this younger version of himself. Mm. Like good. literally think about it and be like, here's something sweet and let me feel this pain. Let me feel the sweetness of you. And like really kind of giving this abandoned part of himself the time, mm -hmm. the time of the day made a huge difference for him. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And thanks for bringing that other side to it. And yeah, I definitely agree. Kind of approaching that with curiosity um, is really important. And, you know, I think there's, un there's layers, right? Like you're kind of peeling it back and being like, oh, here's this again. Oh, how am I, how am I different 
now showing up to this like like what's changed um so yeah it, it's it's interesting so yeah if you do kind of get that anger of revisiting things what happens if you're a little bit more curious about it because you might see things from a different light and a different perspective exactly and you know Jung said that he used the word integration uh synonymously with individuation which for him was the life, right? The lifelong process in which we are slowly descending into our authenticity. And that, that process of feeling like you're an integrated self, something happens, you kind of get deintegrated, right? You're like, what the hell's happening? Some new information, you understand it, you work with it, you integrate it, that's repetitive. That's all of life is that process. So he was even more crude about it. He was like, don't don't even waste energy trying to like fight the process. Like again, use your energy to have a creative outlet and a reflective outlet. Mm. And do what he called, right? For him, it was like this process that he called the transcendent function. Like, how do I sit with this new information and this old self? Work, right? Have practices, reflect on it to create something new. Mm. So out of the two, something new will come, and so on and so forth. This is actually reminding me, we should probably start wrapping up soon, but um, yeah. just this idea of revisiting patterns over and over again. Um, a friend of mine's cleaning out their house and they came across all these old things from their childhood and started to see like, oh, wait, I was still writing about that or I was still talking about that. And I was like, yeah, it's really interesting. Like I go back and read old journals and things that I've done <laughs> like, years ago. And I, I'm reading journals that I've d done like, you know, maybe a month ago. I'm like, it's still the same thing. But, <laughs> um, you know, and it's like, oh, wow, is this just imprinted? Like some of these uh, themes just imprinted in our childhood and it just kind of continues on. And it's just, just a lifelong process, right? Of It's constantly exactly. changing. Exactly. It's constantly morphing a little bit. But, um, yeah, how do you get a little bit more curious about that and explore it? In so exa exactly. So did you read your journal? you like... Nothing changed, like 30 years, and I'm still the same, like this, like the 70 year old. Or do you like, oh, wow, some of this is still happening for me. Like, what, how can I get curious? What can I do differently? Right? It's like the famous, uh, <laughs> he always, I always think about this, uh, Ram Dass stream, which is like, if you think you're enlightened, go spend two weeks with your family. They'll show you exactly where you still have worked. Yeah. Right? Like, can we just accept that as a natural part of our process. And it doesn't mean that you can't grow exponentially in a lot of other dimensions of yourself side by side. We're still dealing with the same things over and over again. <laughs> yeah, and I think that kind of comes back to, is it ever really resolved and are ever healing all that, right? And and what is healing? And I think, you know, coming back to the idea of he healing is somewhat of a relationship and how are we just changing those those different themes or changing exactly. our relationship to those themes over time? Because, yeah, I mean, you know, I talk about the same themes over and over again throughout the years, but my life has changed so dramatically o over the years. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, the relationship has changed over time. Um, much different. Yeah, you, you know, you're making me think about something, Kyle, that it maybe it feels important to mention, which is, right, to, I think one of the other challenges in integration is that we confuse uh, symptom reduction with curing. Yeah. I think a lot of people, right, we, most of us want to go into this thinking that we hope there is conscious or unconscious desire to cure something, that it will never bother me again, which is really in opposition to what we're saying, which is like, no, these are, it's a healing process. Mm -hmm. We repetitively visit something until it doesn't grasp us as much. So I can go to see my parents and I get annoyed, but I don't lose myself in the process like I did 30 years ago. Right. Um, and that symptom reduction is not the same. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and that's something that I also, you know, I wish we can probably talk for a long time about, but right. There's I think there's something that's for psychedelic and entheogenic experiences. That's something that can come very easily. People are like, wow. Oh my God. I don't feel that. I've heard it so much in the ayahuasca circles, for example, like I don't feel anxiety anymore. I don't feel depressed anymore. Hence the problem is done. And then there's this, sometimes it can be a painful experience of like trying to work with the person seeing that that's not the same. Actually, now that 
it's great that you don't are not controlled by your symptoms as much anymore. But that actually just gives us the, the opening to look at the, the, the root cause of why you felt this way. Because that's what's really going to help with that symptom. Because I've also seen, you know, for me, it's more painful to see people who have symptom relief and then they go back. And I've seen this so many times and they're like, great, now I'm not anxious anymore. I can go have the same life I had without anxiety. And seeing people come back heartbroken because the anxiety came back twofold. Right. Or instead of anxiety, like, um, I just heard this from a colleague who had worked with this person who had this great MD the experience. And she's like, oh my God, my anxiety is, I'm done. I have no more anxiety. But after two weeks, she plunged into depression. Mm. And there was still, it was still hard to talk about it in the context of integration, like, no, this is what symptom relief looks like. Now we get a chance to like maybe look a little deeper and like really treat the root cause so you don't have to have those symptoms. Right. Hopefully. Yeah. Not as strong or not at all. Not, yeah. Uh, it's such an important topic and I'm sure we could talk for a longer time about that because I have a lot of thoughts about that as well. Mm. Um, but unfortunately i think we're about at time we're a little over an hour um so we'll we'll have you back on we'll continue this conversation um would love to see that. do you have any i guess last minute kind of like integration tips or advice for folks um ooh, great question um yes one seek seek community even if it's a person to work with um or a, a whole group of people uh, don't do it alone. Even if you think you can, you don't have to. Um, if you feel a little shy or shamed or embarrassed, um, I would say come anyway. We're all doing our best. Um, and I think in those circles, people really see that we're just doing our best and people are here to support each other as opposed to anything else. So I would really encourage that encourage people to um, seek out knowledgeable communities. Um, I think there's a lot of really good people there with great, great intentions, but if you're coming to work with on some intense trauma, find someone who can, who knows how to work with intense trauma. Um, yeah, resources. Um, there's a lot of great you know, your podcast, what you guys do online, um, what we here in the integration circle try to do in San Francisco in the Bay. There's a lot of groups out there that have, there are great resources, reach out. Um, as the same, there's a lot of great podcasts, a lot of great YouTube videos, people like Gabor Mate and Jota Four and a lot of, right, and Susana Bustos and a lot of people who, who have talks that can give pieces of information that are useful. Um, to shift from criticism to curiosity. <laughs> that would be a big one. It's important. Uh, it's really important to honor, honor your experience. Take it, you know, there's this thing about don't take yourself too seriously and like actually take, in this case, take yourself seriously. At least at the beginning, honor the sacred experience that you had, honor yourself um, and treat it accordingly. Um, and yeah, and like, you know, you brought up the idea of experimenting and I used the word play and to, to find safety through a community, through your, in our, inside ourselves, inside with our community to, to play, to play with reality, to experiment, to play and, and see, see what you can co-create with reality. Cause that's why we're doing all this work with eventually for me in the end anyway. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, reminds me of a, a question my one teacher asked me one time. He said, when was the last time you played? And I think that's important. When was the last time you played? And if, if it's been a while, maybe try to go have some fun. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and be a little bit more playful. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, anywhere that uh, you, do you have an online presence? I know you have a website, Integration Circle. Is that dot yes. com or so, anywhere people can find Integration you? Circle. So we have a group of um, these are therapists. We have an astrologer on board. Um, we have someone who does body work. Um, we call the the Integration Circle. So um, Facebook, Instagram, and we're still going to launch our website. So look us up there. Um, or look me independently, just in Doko in San Francisco. I think it'll be, it's very easy to find. So those will be the best places to find us. Awesome. Well, Dr. Ido Cohen, thank you so much for your time. and Thank you so much, Kyle. Really appreciate it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Ido Cohen. Um, really had a great time chatting with him. Uh, I felt like my brain was just firing with so many questions and um, feel like I could have just chatted with him for hours. And uh, we did catch up for a while after we hit stopped recording. Um, some really interesting conversations kind of came out of it. Also wanted to highlight that we didn't even get to chat about young and shadow work, which I think is a huge, huge topic uh, within the psychedelic field. And so I'm sure you will be hearing more from Dr. Cohen um, in the future on psychedelics today, because this is a topic that we definitely want to jump into um, in a little bit more depth. And it seems like he has a lot to say about it. So stay tuned and hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you haven't subscribed, be sure you subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're feeling called, leave a review, please. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, reviews are just helpful, especially in some of the algorithms and just also helping boost the ratings. Um, so if you feel called to leave a review, we would very much appreciate that. And yes, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for supporting the show. And we'll catch you on the next episode of Psychedelics Today. Signing off and have a great week, everybody. Thank you.